Welcome, everybody, to the Heritage Foundation. My name is John Malcolm. I am the uh, Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government, and I'm also the Director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Uh, I hope you've taken a moment to silence your phones. Uh, it's always a pleasure to welcome Senator Mike Lee of Utah uh, to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Senator Lee is here today to talk about the Take Care Act, which he recently introduced. As my colleague Cully Stimson and I pointed out in a recent article, the Take Care Act is in keeping with speeches Senator Lee has given, books that he has written, and bills that he has introduced each of which stresses the importance of constitutional separation of powers to providing political accountability and to protecting our liberties. Senator Lee comes by his deep knowledge and respect of the Constitution quite naturally. His father, Rex Lee, was a solicitor general in the Reagan administration and frequently regaled his family with discussions about uh, legal issues and constitutional issues around the kitchen table. And Senator Lee attended many of his father's arguments before the US Supreme Court. After graduating from Brigham Young uh, Law School, Senator Lee clerked for United States District Court Judge D. Benson in Utah, then future Justice Samuel Alito on the Third Circuit, and then he later returned to clerk for Justice Alito on the Supreme Court. Prior to being elected to the Senate in 2010, Senator Lee spent several years in private practice at the firm of Sidley and Austin. He also served as an assistant United States attorney and as general counsel for then governor, now ambassador, John Huntsman. All in all, I would say that's a pretty good resume for a United States Senator. Please join me in welcoming Senator Mike Lee. Some in that context might say it's a pretty good resume up until be, the time you decided to run for office. Uh, we, we've got as an institution an approval rating that is not high. Uh, uh, the United States Congress, once a revered institution, is now less so. But some of my remarks have to do a little bit with that and have to do with how we got where we got. There is um, something of a persistent tendency within American politics to cast one's political opponents, uh, particularly if they happen to occupy or are seeking the presidency, as tyrants and as despots. It, this has been a fairly consistent theme. And in some ways, I guess it shouldn't be all that surprising, uh, just given the way our country was founded, given the fact that we had a war to throw off the yoke of a foreign king, and not just of a king, but of a a somewhat despotic, uh, distant parliament uh, in which we were not represented. So the rhetoric of the founding era is, of course, replete with denunciations of British oppression. Uh, one of the most famous, of course, uh, being James Otis's assertion that taxation without representation is tyranny. And it, it's always a good time of year as we approach Independence Day to review the Declaration of Independence, to review in particular the indictment section of the Declaration of Independence for us to remind ourselves of why it is that we don't fly the Union Jack, why it is that we don't sing God Save the Queen, uh, why it is that we decided to become our own country. I've thought a lot about this in recent years, so much so that I decided to write a book called Our, our Lost Declaration. It came out recently. I, I'd invite any of you who are interested in such things to read it. Um, I'm told it's one of the best books ever written about the Declaration of Independence <laughs> by a sitting U.S. Senator from the state of Utah, <laughs> at least in the last six months. So. Um, and as I said, this, this strand of um, political rhetoric um, uh, that was forged and in many ways influenced by the American Revolution has endured throughout our history. It seems like a whole lot of major figures, including some who were frequently revered, including some who were frequently reviled, or a combination of the two, um, ha have at some point or another been cast off as something of a despot. Uh, we can think of uh, many examples among US presidents. Andrew Jackson, um, sometimes referred to as King Andrew and not necessarily in a kind way. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was frequently um, derided as someone 
who had become a despot or who was trying to act like a king. And of course, it doesn't end there. Uh, you hear those terms today from time to time, particularly by uh, those who don't like our current president. And at almost any moment in American history, you can hear terms like that being thrown around in a denigrating way uh, toward whoever the current occupant of the Oval Office happens to be. Well, Americans' tendency to see would-be dictators behind every corner is in some ways a testament to their love of freedom and in some ways just reminiscent of the way we became a country. I think in some ways it has somewhat missed the point about the type of danger to the Republican form of government, the type of danger that we face to liberty, to freedom, to divided power. Because while a despotic king is, of course, a clear and present threat to liberty, there are other threats that are very significant, that stand right before us and sometimes go unnoticed simply because they don't involve a throne and a crown. While the public has been vigilantly watching for the second coming of King George III, uh, and, and has done so for some two and a half centuries now, an entirely different type of tyranny has taken shape. It's a type of tyranny that's largely unrecognized as such by the American public, and thus unguarded against. The fact is that this form of tyranny came about gradually, it came about without a whole lot of fanfare, and it came about in a way that should have been somewhat predictable. It's not as if we hadn't been warned that this sort of thing could happen. Now, the most far-sighted of these warnings uh, was arguably issued by Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America. Um, I love reading Tocqueville. Uh, one time a few years ago, I happened to be in France and I was on a long train ride and I pulled out my iPad and decided it was time to reread Democracy in America. There was something about reading it in his homeland as he was writing about my homeland um, th that made it particularly poignant. But he warned us what could happen uh, way back in the 1830s. And he, he discerned that tyranny in a democratic society like ours likely would not take the form of violent, overtly aggressive despotism. Rather, he suggested that it would consist of, quote, an immense and tutelary power, which is absolute, minute, regular, provident, and mild. It covers the surface of society with a network of small, complicated rules, minute and uniform, through which the most original minds and the most energetic characters cannot penetrate. The will of man is not shattered, but softened bent and guided, close quote. Now, if this isn't prescience, I don't know what is. If this doesn't describe the modern federal administrative state, I don't know what does. A somewhat more recent warning came from Charles Evans Hughes uh, in an address delivered at the Harvard Law School during the uh, period of time between when he left the Supreme Court as an associate justice uh, and he later returned to the Supreme Court in 1930 as a Chief Justice. He noted that there is, quote, a disposition to revert to the methods of tyranny in order to meet the problems of democracy, intent on some immediate exigency, and with slight consideration of larger issues, we create autocratic power. And we should know by this time that arbitrariness is quite as likely to proceed from an unrestrained administrative officer of the Republic, reigning by the grace of an indefinite statute, as by the personal government of a despotic king, close quote. As I've made apparent by this point, the real threat to freedom today is not the much anticipated rise of some sort of American Mussolini, at least not today. Uh, rather, it is much more the, the conglomerate of unelected regulators and bureaucrats uh, that we refer to collectively as the administrative state. Th that is the clear and present threat to our liberty. That is here. It's, it's not hypothetical. It exists today in America. And we should be a lot more freaked out by it than we are, frankly.
At its core, the danger posed by the administrative state is that not only does it regulate every minute detail of American life, but that it does so with little to no popular accountability, little or no accountability to the people affected by it. As Chief Justice Roberts wrote in a case just a few years ago, the growth of the executive branch, which now wields vast power and touches almost every aspect of daily life, heightens the concern that it may slip from the executive's control and thus from the control of the people. That's the point we miss so often when talking about the administrative state, or more frequently, when not talking about the administrative state, is that when you untether it from the political process, sometimes, in fact, very regularly in this town, that is sold as if it were a feature, not a bug, as if it were a solution, not itself a problem, when in fact that is the problem. When people say we want to untether this from the political process, they're wrapping themselves in some sort of flag. They think it's the American flag. In fact, it's uh, some other flag. I'll have to think about which one. Maybe it's the French. In any event, they're wrapping themselves in a flag that is not our own and telling them this is just, this is glorious, this promotes liberty because we're untethering it from the political process. All that means is they're making it unaccountable to the American voter. That should be disturbing to every one of us. And of course, the problem goes far beyond the size of the administrative state. The genius of the framers of our constitutional system was in seeing that more important than a Bill of Rights, or even the overall size of government, is the way that government is structured. Justice Scalia was a master of this conversation. And, and I, I wish we could have a, a hologram version of Justice Scalia um, portrayed a little bit like Princess Leia when she was saying, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. If we could portray a little mini Scalia everywhere, on every desk, every student's desk in America, well, it would be a better place. He talked about this all the time, and, and, and he expressed this quite eloquently, uh, among other places, in his classic dissent in NFIB versus Sibelius. Here's what he said, quote, structural protections, notably the restraints imposed by federalism and separation of powers, are less romantic and have less obvious a connection to personal freedom than the provisions of the Bill of Rights and the Civil War Amendments. But the framers considered structural protections of freedom the most important ones, for which reason they alone were embodied in the original Constitution and not left to later amendment. The fragmentation of power produced by the structure of our government is central to liberty. And when we destroy it, we place liberty at peril. I used to love the way he talked about this. Sometimes when he would speak in public, he would say, any tin horn dictator can have a bill of rights, and many of them do. But most of the time, those bills of rights are not worth the paper they're printed on. Why? Because there are no structural protections in place protecting the people of that country against the dangers associated with and inherent in the excessive accumulation of power in the hands of a few. In diagnosing the many flaws in our federal bureaucracy, we thus need to look beyond its size and beyond how it's structured and beyond how the employees themselves are supervised. There's a great danger here in, in uh, advocating in such a way that we sound like all we want is more efficient government that we just want to be more efficient socialists, that we want the administrative state to be a more efficient form of soft despotism. That's not what we want. What we want is liberty. What we want is to be protected for the people to have their own government accountable to them. This insight has been at the center of recent conservative regulatory reform projects, including, uh, including the Article I project to which I've devoted a great deal of thought and time over the last few years. The Article I project, of course, is a, a bicameral effort in which we've tried to identify, tried to scan the horizon, looking for areas in which Congress has excessively delegated its lawmaking power to the executive branch, usually to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. In essence, the structural pr provisions of the Constitution, if adhered to, have very little room for an overbearing, out-of-control administrative state. In fact, when you, when you look at the principles of federalism embodied in the original Constitution, coupled with 
the separation of powers embodied in the original Constitution, supplemented by the Tenth Amendment um, and highlighted in many ways by Article I, Section 7, which sets out the formula for how you pass law. You cannot pass a federal law in our republic without passage in the House of Representatives, passage in the Senate, and presentment to the President of the United States. You can't do it. So there is no daylight between that and a prohibition against anything like what we have in the modern administrative lawmaking apparatus today. Article three provides that the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. That means that an agency does not get a final say on what the law is, at least not in the context of adjudicating the rights of citizens. The fact that despite these structural provisions, we do in fact have an overbearing, out of control, administrative state, shows that somewhere along the way, somewhere between 1787 when this thing was written, and 1789 when it was ratified, and the years following that when it was amended uh, uh, on a handful of occasions. Something went terribly, terribly wrong. And since each branch has some responsibility for checking the administrative state, the problem can be laid in some ways at the feet of all branches. Now, Congress's tendency to, to make vague, open-ended delegations of what is essentially, and in many cases indisputably, legislative power to administrative agencies is, of course, at the heart of the problem. In doing that sort of thing, we as a Congress have essentially farmed out our constitutional obligation to write laws. Uh, we've handed it over to bureaucrats who were in no way chosen by the people, in no way accountable to the people. We've delegated that which Charles de Montesquieu described as something that cannot, should not, must not be delegated. The lawmaking power is sacred, and the lawmaking power is dangerous. In fact, it is the most dangerous power. We are, in fact, the most dangerous branch. We were always intended to be. The power to make law involves the power to destroy all sorts of things. And so that's why it was entrusted only to that branch of government most accountable to the people at the most regular intervals. Similarly, under the doctrine of Chevron, uh, uh, Chevron deference, referring, of course, to that awful case back in the 1980s, Chevron versus NRDC, the, the courts have ceded their duty to say what the law is to administrative agencies. The agencies thus, in many cases, not only write the laws, but also execute them and get more or less a final say on their meaning. This in the words of James Madison in, in Federalist 47, is the very definition of tyranny. It's not just something that can lead to it. it. It is tyranny. To correct these problems, I've been pleased to support and co-sponsor legislation in the current Congress, the 116th, uh, and also previous Congresses uh, that would bring the administrative state back in line with structural safeguards in the Constitution. The Reins Act, by requiring agencies to submit major rules to Congress for approval would go a long way toward restoring lawmaking authority to the appropriate institution. In fact, if, if you're not familiar with the RAINS Act, I'd encourage you to become familiar with it. The, the acronym is R-E-I-N-S. It stands for Regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny. I sometimes uh, wonder in the middle of the night, if I had a legislative magic wand and I could wave that wand, what current proposal would I pass? It might well be the RAINS Act for the simple reason that about $2 trillion of our economy goes right out the door just through compliance with federal regulations every year. It's not to say none of those should be law, but nearly all of that cost is brought about by a de facto law created by someone who is not elected and not accountable in any real way to anyone who is elected. Similarly, the Separation of Powers Restoration Act would ensure that federal judges and not career bureaucrats say what the law is. There's a, a, another fantastic proposal out there um, called the Global Trade Accountability Act that would do for trade policy what the RAINS Act would do for regulatory policy. That is, anytime the executive branch is exercising one of these powers, is tantamount to starting a trade war 
uh, whether under Section 232 or, or, or otherwise, uh, that would have to go through Congress. It would have to be approved by Congress uh, and affirmatively enacted into law rather than just taking effect automatically. But more is needed. We need to not only reform Congress's and the court's relationship with the administrative state, but the president's as well. Article two of the Constitution unquestionably establishes a unitary executive. Now, what that means um, is often distorted by the news and entertainment media. If you've seen the recent movie about Dick Cheney, they offered one of the most butchered explanations of what the unitary executive is. And um, it really made me want to write a harshly worded letter to the uh, uh, to the screenwriter uh, to ask that it be changed, but there are probably better ways for me to use my time. Um, the, the vesting clause, for example, uh, provides that the executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America. As Alexander Hamilton explained in Federalist Number 70, placing the totality of the executive power in a single individual was not a mistake. This did not occur by mere happenstance, nor was it out of um, sheer reverence for George Washington, which most of the founders had, and many of the founders had George Washington in mind when they wrote the Constitution. Nevertheless, uh, they knew, of course, George Washington wouldn't be around forever, and notwithstanding their great reverence for George Washington, who they were many, if not most of them, determined uh, to, to see as the first president, they knew that this power would have to be carefully constrained, and so they did it. But notwithstanding that, they did, uh, they did consolidate all executive power within that person. Um, the delegates to the convention recognized that a unified executive was essential to ensure energy and accountability in the execution of the laws, and so they drafted it accordingly. Oh, without the authority to supervise and direct his subordinates, it would be impossible for the president to fulfill his duty imposed by Article II to, the, to take care that the laws be fully executed. He could not do that. So the Constitution doesn't issue impossible commands. It would not have issued that thinking that vast swaths of the executive branch would be entirely outside the control of the president. The founders also understood that the president's power to remove executive officers was the bedrock of his authority to oversee the executive branch. It was a without which not of that authority. In a famous debate in the first Congress, James Madison argued that, quote, if any power whatsoever is in its nature executive, it is the power of appointing, overseeing, and controlling those who execute the laws, close quote. He went on to note that if the president should possess alone the power of removal from office, those who are employed in the execution of the law will be in their proper situation and the chain of dependence be preserved. They will depend as they ought on the president and the president on the community. Now Madison's arguments prevailed, of course, uh, and, and the first Congress declined for specifically these reasons for constitutional reasons, on constitutional grounds, to create restrictions on the president's removal power over the heads of the newly established executive departments. That was the original understanding of the removal power. And it predominated for nearly 150 years after the founding. This was not a coincidence. Now, it, it wasn't, I'm not trying to suggest that James Madison is entitled to our unflinching deference on every issue, simply because, you know, he wrote a lot of it. But it was him and the arguments that he made that were themselves rooted in the text and the historical understanding of that document that caused them to reach that conclusion. And it was that conclusion that stuck for about 150 years after the Constitution was written. That tragically changed with the 1935 decision in Humphrey's executor, in which the Supreme Court held for the first time that Congress can impose restrictions on the president's removal power. For whatever reason, I find it coincidental 
that a lot of the stuff, the really bad stuff from the court, started in 1935. Started about the time they moved into their new building. Maybe we should have kept them in the Capitol. <laughs> in, in so holding, the Supreme Court overruled its earlier precedent in Myers versus United States, in which the court had held that Congress cannot limit the president's ability to remove principal officers within the executive branch of government. But Humphrey's executor, you see, did not simply overrule Myers. Rather, as Justice Scalia later wrote, quote, it gutted in six quick pages devoid of textual or historical precedent, a carefully researched and reasoned 70 page opinion. That juxtaposition alone tells you a lot of what you need to know about those decisions. What one had constitutional text and historical precedent on its side, as well as original understanding backing it up. The other was constitutional law by judicial fiat. The results have been as troubling as they were predictable, and in fact, predicted by people like Alexis de Tocqueville. Since Humphrey's executor's radical departure from the original understanding, for cause removal protections, meaning laws such as the provision of the Federal Trade Commission Act that provides that commissioners can be removed only, quote, for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office, have proliferated, giving rise to a vast, extensive, powerful, and in many ways headless fourth branch of government that exists beyond the reach of the president. And because it exists within the executive branch, but beyond the officer in charge of the executive branch, who is himself elected, it exists beyond the reach of the people. By some estimations, there are over 80 independent agencies within the executive branch. The fact that we even have to speak in terms of estimates here, and in numbers that large, is itself a little, a little jarring. They are entrusted with regulating immense swaths of American life, from competition policy and workplace safety to labor relations and securities law. They make rules, they adjudicate rights, and they enforce laws. The potential for abuse is tremendous. The inconsistency with the Republican principles embodied in the Constitution and upon which our country was founded are obvious. So to address this problem and to try to restore the unitary executive, uh, which is to say to restore uh, the Constitution as it was drafted, as it was understood by those who drafted it, as it is still properly understood today, I've introduced a new bill, a new piece of legislation called the Take Care Act. Just as the Reins Act would reform Congress's relationship with the administrative state, and the Separation of Powers Restoration Act would do so for the courts, the Take Care Act would bring the federal bureaucracy back in line with the dictates of Article II, putting it back appropriately within what the founders designed as the executive branch of the US government. The bill would accomplish this goal by stripping away all, four, all existing four-cause removal protections from the so-called independent agencies. It would also limit Congress's ability to create four-cause protections by implication in the future and take other critical steps to fortify the president's directive authority. Simply put, the Take Care Act would eliminate the headless fourth branch of the federal government. It would empower the president to ensure the faithful execution of the law and would make the bureaucracy accountable to the people again. Importantly, the Take Care Act would not cause the work of the administrative agencies to become subject to the arbitrary whim and caprice of the president. There are myriad political constraints, including the Senate's advice and consent role that would ensure, much as they do now throughout much of the government, that executive officers can fulfill their congressional responsibilities, their statutorily assigned duties without undue interference. So th there are a lot of people, a lot of principal officers within the executive branch of government 
who can be removed by the president for any reason at any time, for any reason at all, or no reason at all. And yet, we don't have Armageddon there. We don't see signs of the end of days. Dogs and cats living together in the streets, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen. And in, in many cases, people in this administration and in many previous administrations who can be fired aren't because presidents know that there are other bad things that can happen if the president is too quick to fire someone with whom he happens to disagree. Another concern I sometimes hear about uh, with respect to the Take Care Act is that uh, some say that it would give more power to the president at a time when the president is already to, uh, able to dominate in many interactions with Congress. Well, there's some truth to this. I'd still rather have the president act as president. And, and I say that e even if we're talking about some future president with whom I well, would likely disagree a lot. Let's say a, a future president, Elizabeth Warren. I would rather have even that president wield executive power than an unknown technocrat. And frankly, so would the American people. As William Buckley once said, I'd sooner live in a society governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston Telephone Directory than in a society governed by the 2,000 faculty members of Harvard University. And this kind of ties in here because Elizabeth Warren is, in fact, a Harvard professor. And unlike a technocrat, um, she, if elected president at some unknown point in the future, would have to answer to the first 2,000 people listed in the Boston area telephone book. And not just to them, but all, all the rest of the American people. She would have to answer to them, the unknown, nameless, faceless bureaucrat. However well-educated, well-intentioned, hardworking, and highly specialized, would not have to answer to the American people, not ever. And so this is one of the arguments that people will frequently make. Well, these people are smart. It doesn't doesn't matter. I mean, I've actually had arguments like this raised in response to what about the due process concern? What about the, the way you make laws uh, contra contradicting our system of government and the fact that it's supposed, a law is supposed to be made by Congress? A whole lot of people will say, well, in Agency X, we have really smart people. That, that is not an answer. It certainly isn't an answer to the question about tyranny uh, as being power wielded by those who are not authorized to wield it and who are beyond the control of, uh, of, of the people in, in our Republican form of government. Moreover, as I've said, a would-be dictator in the White House is not the threat to freedom that we're facing right now. Rather, it's Tocqueville's immense and tutelary power, and so we need to act accordingly. But we do need to act. Well, I started my remarks today by noting the key difference between our current fight for freedom and the American Revolution. I want to close by noting an important similarity. If the founders' rallying cry was no taxation without representation, ours must be, or must at least involve, no regulation without representation, which, if we are honest with ourselves, can also be rephrased as no legislation without representation. To make law, to make federal law in our republic, you have to follow the formula of Article 1, Section 7. You've got to have bicameral passage, House and the Senate, followed by presentment to the president. Without that, you can't make law. At its core, that is precisely what the Take Care Act and the broader conservative regulatory reform agenda, of which this is a part, are all about to be consistent with the basic principles of this country, the principles upon which it was founded, uh, our government must be representative of, and therefore answerable to, the people. Fortunately, the way to accomplish that goal, while not easy by any stretch of the imagination, is itself straightforward. We need only look to the structural design of the Constitution and reform the administrative state accordingly. This is still simple. It's one of the simplest features of our Constitution, and it's also 
the most important. Thank you. So, so the senator has a, a hard stop at 12.50, which means we only have time for a couple of questions. And they will have to be quick and short and end with a question mark. And I would, I would suggest, by the way, as we're going through this, I was thinking about the RAINS Act, that more robust usage of the Congressional Review Act, while hardly it does deal with separation of powers, might get you part of the way towards this. But I realize it's not an adequate substitute. Let's go over here. Uh, where is this bill? Hold on, you got a microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, how likely is this bill to gain traction in Congress, and what do you think needs to happen for, for that to occur? The good news is that it's extremely likely to gain traction in Congress. The bad news is I don't know when because the bill was just filed. But uh, consistent with what Winston Churchill said, the American people will always do the right thing after they've exhausted every other alternative. <laughs> We've given the modern administrative state 80 good years. That's a nice long try. It's bad. we got to undo it. Uh, Ilya Shapiro from the Federalist 51 Appreciation Society and, <laughs> and, and the Cato Institute. Um, are, are your uh, series of bills, you know, some affecting Article 1, some 2, some 3, uh, are they innovating on the founders' design given modern problems, or are, they, or are they in effect saying adding to every part of the Constitution and we mean it? A little bit of both. It's mostly the latter. It's, it's not really all that innovative. Um, each of the pieces of legislation that you describe and that I, and that I reference are really just, um, I don't want to say reinventing the wheel, but they're pointing back to the fact that our system of government is supposed to be a wheel and saying wheels are round and you've got edges on this one, take off the edges. Um, in some respects, they're innovating a little bit in that they're recognizing that, so we're at point A, we need to get to point B. In order to get to point B, we have to we have to take into account where point A is. So with the RAINS Act, for example, it's not necessarily how we would have designed it from the outset, but it is the cleanest way of restoring Article I, Section 7 um, that, that uh, allows us to, to start with our existing structure. Because it doesn't require us to tear down every one of those agencies. It's just that it w would require Congress to approve legislation um, and to affirmatively act and act it into, into law rather than having it go into effect automatically as a regulation. Um, Congress got a, a, around this for a long time by using the executive, the, the legislative veto. And, and when the Supreme Court undid the legislative veto and said that it violated uh, uh, the presentment clause of Article I, Section 7, a lot of people thought that Congress would stop excessively delegating lawmaking power. It didn't. Congress saw this as an invitation to step on the gas. And so that's one reason why Congress itself has to remake the, the, the power. And so too here with the Take Care Act. Um, it's just requiring us to do what is already required to begin with, which is the president can fire people who are our principal officers of the executive branch. Last question down here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi. Um, when considering the Congress's delegation of monetary policy to the Federal Reserve, uh, would you also consider that kind of a misdelegation of, of kind of power to an unelected group of officials? Yes. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of people who, who there will say, yeah, but this one is important. And I say, oh, okay, well, so is everything else in government. I mean, we, we, we uh, de minimis non curat lex, the, the, the law doesn't deal with that which is insignificant. And so the fact that um, uh, whether it's the the Federal Reserve or, or any other so-called independent agency, the fact that it's important, that it affects a lot of people, does not, as I read the Constitution, give us permission to deviate from clear constitutional commands. The fact that that power could be abused by a future president is concerning, but it's far less concerning, I believe, than what happens when you put de facto lawmaking power, hardcore federal lawmaking power, in the hands of people who have no connection to those they govern whatsoever. So it is not as though we would descend into a lawless hellhole by doing this. Far from it. We'd actually be returning power back to the people where it belongs. It's not as though uh, some people will say, well, you, you'll have presidents doing things, hiring, uh, firing people in independent agencies. 
recklessly, relentlessly, without a, a, any rationale or with an overt political motive. Um, sure, that could happen. But when that happens, there are consequences. And there are consequences that presidents of both political parties of every conceivable political orientation lose sleep about. And there's nothing about the passage of the Take Care Act that's going to change that. If anything, this is going to make people more careful, not less, about who is hired, who is fired, and most importantly, what laws are passed in our republic. So, Senator, we know you raced to get here after a vote. We know you got a race hat now. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.